Welcome to a special edition of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. I've been saying basically those very words at the start of every show for the last 10 years. Exactly 10 years ago today, we launched our first show from our Pier 3 studios on the Embarcadero to cover how technology was changing the world. The co-founder of Netscape, Mark Andreessen, was our very first guest. He had just started a venture capital firm that promised to shake up Silicon Valley. Four kids, yep, four kids, and about 2,600 shows later, technology is still changing the world now faster than ever. And over the next hour, we're going to look back on the decade that was and look ahead to the decade to come with special guests, including Reid Hoffman, co-founder of LinkedIn and an investor at Greylock Partners, who was my first guest on Studio 1.0. Aileen Lee, the tech investor who coined the term startup unicorn, started Cowboy Ventures and the women in tech group All Race to change the gender ratio in Silicon Valley. And Nikesh Arora, who also joined us on our very first show as Google's chief business officer, later moving to SoftBank and then becoming CEO of Palo Alto Networks. They will share their visions for the biggest tech disruptions to come. But first, here are some of our clips of the most memorable interviews over the last 10 years. Now, once you get people connected, once you have the power to reach them, how do you use that power? Well, I mean, for us, it's really all about enabling people. The internet is a big enabler. It helps connect people to the, the modern economy. And um, if we can help do that, then that's amazing. With all that we know now, do you believe that Facebook played a decisive role in electing Donald Trump? The overall picture here, I don't think anyone knows yet, but it's an important question, and I think it's one that's going to be studied for years and years to come. Where we're focused now is taking the lessons of past elections and making sure we apply them going forward. How would you characterize Tim Cook's Apple versus Steve Jobs' Apple? Steve's DNA will always be the DNA of Apple. Uh, I think it's deeply embedded in the company, and we celebrate it and uh, it should be like that, it should stay like that. What do you think it is that the tech industry is doing wrong that makes so many people wonder, are they too big, too powerful, and abusing that power? Big by itself is not bad, but competition is good. Uh, and more importantly, it's not just competition, but it's that point I made earlier, which is you need to have a business model uh, that really is aligned with the world doing well. Much more to celebrate this hour on this 10-year anniversary. But first, I want to get a look at the markets with our own Ed Ludlow. Ed, now we know. I've had a lot of haircuts over the last 10 years. Um, but tell us about the day in tech today. Yeah, risk on mode in the markets. Best day for U.S. equities since June. And a rebound in technology stocks, of course, at the center of that. The S&P 500, the main gauge of U.S. equities, up around 2.5%. But you can see the NASDAQ 100, a very tech-heavy index, outperforming. A big part of that was Apple, the biggest points mover. It had a horrid week last week, but rebounding. And I want to talk quickly about Zoom, up 9% in regular hours ahead of earnings, but reporting after the bell a huge surge in fourth quarter top line growth. And the pleasing thing for investors is that Zoom, which has found such relevancy during the global pandemic, coronavirus pandemic, sees that gain in growth carrying on through 2022. Not at the same level, but still top of mind. So that's really bullish for Zoom. Looking forward, Emily. It's kind of fitting, Ed, that tech is having such a bullish rebound today. I mean, I feel like we've been asking the same question over the last 10 years. Are we in a tech bubble? And we're still asking that question. Yeah, if you were an investor watching that first show 10 years ago and you'd put your money in big tech, you'd be laughing because there's been big outperformance. If you look at all the major indices that track tech stocks relative to the S&P 500, the biggest outsized performance was in the NYSE FANG Plus Index, that basket of mega cap tech stocks. When you first started the show, there was not a single $1 trillion company in terms of market cap. Now we have four. And the NYSE Fung Plus Index, you can see on your screen, up more than 600% over the last 10 years, really sort of dwarfing the S&P 500. Can you guess, though, Emily, what the top performing stock on the NASDAQ 100 has been over the last 10 years? Ooh, you're testing me. Um, I feel like I got to say Tesla. And if it's not Tesla, then I missed something. 
course, this Tesla. You interviewed Elon Musk in March 2012. <laughs> and since that time, the stock has gained an astonishing 14,900%, almost 15,000%. Forget all the cars it's delivered. But when you put its gains side by side with the other best performers on the NASDAQ 100, it really puts it into context. Names like Amazon, Netflix, which themselves have come to dominate our lives in how we consume content, how we buy things. Well, the, the gain in Tesla is just astonishing. And these are not new names. These are names that have traded on the index for some time. And Tesla has only really become mainstream in the last few years or so as it's ramped up production. But I thought that that was one that you might like to think back on, Emily. You also found an old clip of an old interview with Elon. Ed, which I appreciate. <laughs> yeah, and I very quickly just want to talk about IPOs as well. You've been there for some of the biggest listings. And I just wanted to ask you, if you look at that list of biggest offerings in terms of dollar value offerings at the time of IPO, what's the most memorable one? What stands out for you? You know, I remember, gosh, maybe because it was one of the first big tech IPOs that I covered was standing outside of Facebook in 2012 when they went public on the NASDAQ, and it was such a crazy day. I don't know if you remember, the stock just had issues with trading on opening day, a lot of drama, um, but yeah, so many over the years. Well, happy anniversary to you, Emily, and thanks for having me along for the ride. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. It's so good to have you, and I hope you'll be here for many more years to come. Thank you, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow in the studio there. Coming up, so much more. The tech investor who coined the term startup unicorn. We're to speak to Cowboy Ventures founder and managing partner Aileen Lee about Silicon Valley's progress on gender equality over the last decade and whether we need a new standard for unicorns. They're a little less rare these days. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Sequoia is very successful, but you have no women partners. What do you think your responsibility is there? I think the issue begins in the high schools and where women, particularly in America and also in Europe, tend to elect not to study the sciences when they're 11 and 12. So suddenly the hiring pool is much smaller. So you think it's a pipeline problem? Because some, it's, say it's people, a, some would say, well, you're not looking hard enough. Oh, uh, we look very hard at them. What we're not prepared to do is to lower our standards. Do you People. think women should try to, you know, for lack of a better word, integrate into male-dominated VC funds? Or should they go off and start their own thing, like Aileen Lee did with Cowboy and Teresa Go has done with Aspect? I think it's great that people are starting their own firms. I think it's going to take women finding the next Facebook, you know, um, black VC finding the next, um, you know, Twitter or the next, you know, Google. And that's going to be what turns people around. And we have to get as many of those people out investing and given opportunities in order to see that happen. Over the last decade, Silicon Valley has faced a reckoning on gender and race. We saw several women investors leave traditional VC firms to chart their own path. One of them was Aileen Lee, who left Kleiner Perkins to found Cowboy Ventures in 2012 and later co-founded All Raise with three dozen women investors to change the ratio in Silicon Valley, all while making big bets on the future of technology herself. Aileen Lee is with me now. Aileen, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad to have you on this special show day. I know. Um, happy work anniversary. Wanna... <laughs> it's exciting. I'm so Thank happy to you. be here. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to have you. Look, I want to start with one of your first big moves after you founded Cowboy, which was the founding, the coining of this term, Startup Unicorn, to refer to tech companies that had hit a billion dollar valuation within 10 years. It has since taken on a life of its own. Did you ever think it would become that big? <laughs> No, I definitely did not. I remember actually doing the analysis and then writing the blog post. And I was actually at a tech conference, the lobby conference, and flying back on the plane with some a bunch of friends in tech. And I, I showed the draft to a couple of people. I'm like, what do you think? Is this interesting? And I think the guy next to me was like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it was definitely not a, this is going to be huge. This is a great name, way to go, kind of a moment. <laughs> Well, clearly it's been more than okay. And now there were 39 unicorns a decade ago when you wrote that. Now there are more than 500. What mm -hmm. does that tell you? Well, uh, 
to be fair, the first analysis was just US, right? And the 500 number does include global, which is I think almost half of the list. So let's say it's 250 in the US, uh, like roughly versus 39. But yeah, I mean, obviously um, there's a lot of merit to the, the phrase, the Andreessen coin phrase, software eating the world. I think just the markets are global. They are bigger than I think we would have guessed. And it's just accelerating, sadly, um, because of COVID, I think. So yeah, the markets for tech and the appetites and the opportunity it presents are amazing. So we'll talk about that in a sec. But because unicorns are now a little less rare, I wonder, do you think we need to move the goalpost at all? Like, should we be talking about 2 billion or 5 billion or, or 10 billion? No right. offense to or the like companies that are worth more than a billion yeah. dollars. Like, what's the name for a trillion dollar company? Like when, when I wrote, did the analysis, there were, were no trillion dollar tech companies and now there's at least two. Uh, no, I think building a, I mean, building a billion dollar company is still very rare and very hard. Uh, so we can come up with other annoying terms for things that are even bigger than a billion dollars. But I still think, I mean, as a person who works with tiny startups, a lot of them, I know what a big milestone that is and how much work it is to get from one to 10 million in revenue and from 10 to 30 million in revenue and from 30 to hundred million dollars in revenue. It's, it takes, it's a huge team effort. And even when you have the most incredible people and the most incredible ideas around the table, sometimes people don't make it even though they have the best of intentions. There are now $4 trillion companies, Aileen. They're all tech oh companies. Gosh. And we're gonna talk about some of those later in the hour, okay. which okay. brings me to, now that you are here, where are you placing your bets? Like, what do you think the unicorns of the next decade are going to be, whether it's specific companies or the sectors they will be in? Yeah. Um, well, I guess I'll use this opportunity to clarify. I think when I started Cowboy eight years ago, I think there was a belief that we would only invest in female founders, which we do love doing or that we would only invest in consumer because I'm a woman. Therefore, I must only know about consumer things or only know about how to work with women. So we do invest, we're generalists, and we actually invest in a lot of enterprise software companies and infrastructure and security and developer tools in addition to consumer. And I think there is so much opportunity in both uh, that we are, you know, it's been a little, uh, we had some exciting consumer stuff going on about five or eight years ago, and then it's been a little dry. And uh, But I think there's a whole new wave in consumer coming up, which is very exciting. Uh, a couple of companies that we've invested in, like The Landing and The Newness, actually are early stage companies that launched last week. And we're very excited about new social, social with privacy and security built in from the beginning, new communities. Uh, and then in enterprise, there's just so much opportunity, especially, I think, in financial services, in learning education and healthcare. So those are areas that we're gonna really lean into. So I think unfortunately uh, COVID has you know, caused so much suffering around the world, but it's really, I think, causing a lot of industries to embrace technology at a much, fa much faster pace than they would have otherwise. Now, it's interesting, and I'm sure interesting for you to look back on those interviews with Mike Moritz of Sequoia and <laughs> Ellen Powell, who, who sued Kreiner that, Perkins. I was, sitting, I was like, my heart was beating. I was like, oh God, she's gonna ask me about it. <laughs> Well, you know, here we are. Like when you left Cowboy, in, in, I mean, when you left Kleiner in 2012, that was a radical move. And that was the context, right? Women weren't doing this. Yeah. And I'm curious how I mean, you reflect was, on that decision now. It wasn't, I mean, I was reflecting on it a little bit because you're at your 10 year anniversary. I'm at my, almost at my eight year with Cowboy. And at the time, um, it, I was one of the only women to found a firm. Kirsten Green and I started around the same time. Um, being a solo GP was a really big deal. There were a lot of LPs who were like, you're a solo GP, how is that gonna work? I don't know, I don't do that. Uh, explaining seed was a thing. Like, you know, I had, it was, a, there were very, there were, there were some great seed firms, but not a lot of them. So explaining this new category called seed, that was really an, like the kind of, it had moved from A being the first institutional round to seed. So a lot has really changed in the past eight years, but it was really, I love the job of working with early stage founders. And I'm so grateful to have worked at Kleiner and worked with incredible people and learned a lot, but it just felt like a good time to kind of move earlier and kind of, start over and in retrospect, it's been a chance for me to actually build a much more um, personal business where I think hopefully we're building a firm where people can really be themselves. And um, I think maybe some of the things that I've done like all raise, I might not have done if I was in a bigger shop where you're just much more self-conscious about what you're saying and you feel like people are um, 
just paying a lot more attention. Speaking of all rays, according to your latest report, women make up 12% of VC decision makers. Women founded startups get 11% of funding. I know that's like slightly better than it was a few years before mm -hmm. that, but I assume you don't think those numbers are good enough. No, we have so far to go. You know, we've said from the beginning, this is going to be at least a 10 year journey, if not longer, because moving the needle is really, moving the numbers takes a long time. Um, I'm hopeful because I think there's much more sensitivity now than there was a few years ago about this inequity. Um, and I'm really hopeful that the next generation of founders, when they're founding the company, instead of it just being the guy that you used to have lunch with at work or the guy that you lived with, that you'll think like, I wanna build the best possible company. So let me recruit a founding team and founding employees that represent all kinds of backgrounds so I can recruit all kinds of people and also have different voices around the table. So I feel like we're making progress on that front. That's like culture is a leading indicator before numbers, but we have a long way to go. I sat down with Arlen Hamilton, another venture capitalist who's focused on investing in women, people of color, LGBTQ only. Um, take a listen to a, a clip of what she had to say. The thesis is if they uh, are doing things with so little, what happens when we give them more? So I then took that and decided to invest in women, people of color, and LGBT founders. So what if you find the next Mark Zuckerberg and he doesn't fit into any of those categories? You just let him walk away? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> um, sorry, that's, that's actually funny. Um, <laughs> I have zero problem watching another Mark Zuckerberg walk away. Aileen, you know, still today we think of a tech visionary and so many people think of someone who looks like Mark Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. What are we going to think when we think of a tech visionary a decade from now? Will the stereotype, will that image have changed? I think, I do think founders today are different. So uh, there's a really hot startup that's getting a ton of attention right now. And that the CEO, we had a conversation last week and he said, I don't want to build a company like people did 10 years ago. He's like, I want to build a company where I would love help making sure that I have people of color and women on my executive team, on my board, on my cap table, in my company from the beginning. Can you help me with that? Um, I think that's where the world is going. Uh, smart founders know that that's the best and healthiest way to build a resilient company. And we're seeing it with firms. I mean, yes, we have a long way to go, but I think firms realize like they pretended that there was no problems and they pretended that the problem was like pipeline for a long time. And I think they're realizing that their networks are pretty um, uh, homogenous and that by bringing in women and people of color to the partner ranks and to the managing partner ranks, they're gonna be able to attract and demonstrate to founders that they're gonna help them build healthy companies. So I'm hopeful that's changing and that the next set of so, Mark Zuckerbergs will be different. If the next set of Mark Zuckerbergs do get yeah. that chance, how do you think the tech industry will be different in a decade? Like if, if more women get a chance to, to found Facebook or, and people of color get a chance to, to found Google or the next Apple or the next Amazon, does the world change? Yes, completely. I think it will change a ton. I mean, I think when you look at the societal impact, both on people's daily lives um, of these tech products that have on people's, but then also even look at the intergenerational wealth and societal impact created by people like Jeff Bezos or Mark Benioff or Michael Bloomberg. Imagine if women and people of color are at least half of those of that kind of wealth. Like, what kind of projects will be funded? Will the, and the, I think innately the products, the tech products that are built, will be more equitable. Um, like people won't be bullied online as much. They won't like women won't get treated like crap like they do in a lot of social environments, uh, digital ones because they'll actually be part of building the products. Um, so I think it'll be better for everyone. And like, there'll just be more fairness. 100%. I'm not saying everyone's gonna be a billionaire, but it's gonna be better. Well, Ev Williams, the co-founder of Twitter told me that he believes if more women had been involved in creating and starting Twitter, that online harassment wouldn't be as big a problem as it exactly. is today. And I thought that yes, was uh, exactly. quite telling. Um, yeah.
Aileen, thank you so much for joining us. I hope we have a date for a decade from now where you'll be able to talk about tech I will go in the last in 20 year. years. <laughs> and we'll talk tech. <laughs> Happy work anniversary. I'm um, so excited to be a part of this big day for you. Thank, thank you for you. everything you do, Emily. It's thank amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Aileen. So wonderful to have you. Aileen Lee, founder and managing partner of Cowboy Ventures there. And of course, all rays will be watching to see how they change things this decade. All right, coming up, a decade of debuts. We're going to bring you to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, where some of the biggest tech companies hit the public markets. That is next. This is a special edition of Bloomberg Technology. In terms of users, some people still come to Twitter. They're a little confused. It takes time to, to figure out who to follow. How do you improve that from a product perspective to get to a billion? Yeah, I think that one of the fascinating things about Twitter is that once you get it, it becomes indispensable to you. You know, I just talked to a few people this morning who said, it's, I get up every morning, it's the first thing I do, and it's an absolutely indispensable companion to the live experience for me. Someone suggested a joint venture with Amazon. Would that ever happen? Oh, really? I heard about it from you. I have never heard about that. <laughs> <laughs> but if, uh, I would be interested in talking, because as, as always, anything. Anybody that involved in helping small business, we will feel excited. Jack, a lot of people are looking at Square as an example that these private tech unicorns are overvalued. What do you think? I don't know. I'm not an economist. We have an economist on our board, Larry Summers, <laughs> so you should talk to him. But you've compared the company to Amazon. You've got some investors out there who think it might be more like an eBay. There are just big questions about how big the ride-hailing market can be. How do you deliver on the Amazon? Well, we just have to, we've got, we've got to execute. And when you think about what Amazon did, they went beyond a bookseller to other categories of retail, we're doing the same thing. And I think that the ones who bet on us, the investors who bet on us, long term, are going to be happy. Those are just some of the CEOs I've had the opportunity to speak with over the course of 10 years here at Bloomberg Technology and... Coming up, we're going to speak to a few more. A very special guest, Nikesh Arora, who appeared on our debut show exactly 10 years ago. Then he was Google's chief business officer. Now he's CEO of the cybersecurity firm Palo Alto Networks. Also coming up is Reid Hoffman, LinkedIn co-founder and Greylock partner, one of the earliest investors in Facebook and Airbnb. Where will he be placing his bets in the next decade? We'll ask. This is Bloomberg. So proud of our team for getting to this day. It's been such a journey. And for those first people that believed in us and, and subscribed to this radical idea of a woman making the first move, you know, they have been really what drove this home um, and given me courage and confidence and motivation along the journey. We just got indication on your opening price. Uh, shares indicated to open right now at $139 a share, which is more than double what you priced at. I mean, are you at all concerned about froth? What do you think about that number and the potential uh, that you're leaving billions of dollars on the table? That's the first time I've heard that number. Um, that is, that's a, I, you know, when we, in April, we raised money um, and it was a debt financing. It, 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 that price would have priced us around 30 bucks. So I, I don't know what else to say. It, it's that that's a that's a that's a very that that's um, that is. Yeah, I'm very humbled by it. You've seen a number of high-profile IPOs over the last couple of months. Airbnb, DoorDash, Affirm, Poshmark doubling or more than doubling on opening day. Do you see something wrong with that picture? Oh, absolutely. I think all those companies could theoretically be held accountable for violating fiduciary duty. Um, Selling the most valuable asset you own at half the market price, knowingly, knowingly doing that, um, is just, it's ignorance. It has been a wild ride for tech markets over the last decade, and especially so for tech IPOs. Just in the last several weeks, newly public companies like Airbnb and Bumbled are valued at more than twice their opening day prices, 
What does that signal about markets in the next decade? Joining us to discuss a very special guest, Nikesh Arora, CEO of Palo Alto Networks, previously COO of SoftBank and Google's chief business officer. Nikesh, you were on our very first episode 10 years ago, so I'm so grateful you're here with us today. And I wanted to start with the public markets now, given everything you've seen from Google to SoftBank uh, to now running a public company, do you think we're in a bubble that's about to pop? Well, I think, uh, Emily, I remember being an analyst in 1999 and looking at the markets, uh, and the markets were, I think, well ahead of their expectations. I think today it's slightly different. I think if you look at what we went through the pandemic, you look at where interest rates are, money is cheap, so you are seeing valuations run slightly ahead of where they need to be. But I also believe the next decade is going to be the golden era of tech. So you might believe the golden era of tech is behind us. I think the next 10 years is going to be even more tech enabled than the last 10 years have been. To some degree, some of the valuations may be okay. I think money is cheap, therefore people are, are sort of putting a lot more expectations into the stocks that are going public right now. Some of this will normalize, but I think uh, a lot of them might just write it out. I think you had Ed before who showed you that 15,000% return on Tesla in 10 years. Could you call that? Probably not. Why do you think the next 10 will be the golden era or more golden than the last? If you look at the pandemic that we just went through, it proved to us that every company that survived this or that every company that's doing well right now, every one of their customers, everyone has converted to tech. The people who were the most reluctant adopters of tech are now tech savvy and they're tech first because they're the most vulnerable parts of our society who are basically having to go do everything remotely, whether it's you know, DoorDash or Uber Eats or Instacart, all of these things which are going to have to go through a technology adoption curve have literally had their entire expectations change within the span of one year, what would have taken five to seven years. Look at Zoom. Every one of these phenomena, which are tech first phenomena, have happened in a very compressed period of time, which basically are changing consumer sentiment, consumer behavior, forcing all the bricks and mortars to get very, very tech enabled very, very quickly, driving a huge amount of demand both in the enterprise side as well as on the consumer front. Now, you've been on the show a few times over the last decade, and when I went back to look at that old interview, that first interview from 10 years ago, I realized I could ask some of the same questions I asked then today, like <laughs> how does Google diversify revenue beyond advertising? Does Google have too much power? Um, Google's power is being scrutinized right now, and I wonder, do you think Google has too much power, or is it a monopoly? Well, you know, I think in the last 10 years, obviously, there's been very many tech companies that have become very large, and they've become large purely because their products have been loved by customers, whether it's a Facebook, Google, Apple, all these companies have seen tremendous amount of consumer adoption of their products because so they become large because they're global companies, and hence, they generate a lot of revenue around the world. I think there are certain parts of all of their businesses that need to be looked at because now they're the new order. You know, 10 years ago, I remember being in a show and we were still deemed as a challenger. Today, this is a new order and there are certain parts of the new order that need to be scrutinized. So the power of big tech in general then, do you believe we need more regulation? Are there any breakups in order, whether it's Google or Apple or Amazon or Facebook? Uh, I think to your first point, in terms of power of big tech, as long as there's competitive products available in the market, I don't think being big is bad. As long as there are people who have a choice, they can go, go from your product to somebody else's product, as long as you're not being held captive to a certain piece of technology. I don't think that's necessarily bad. You have global companies that can operate around the world remotely, effectively, in 100 plus countries without having to set up physical infrastructure, you are going to get larger companies. You are going to get many more trillion dollar companies which, whose underpinning will be tech. So I don't think tech is bad per se in itself. I think there are certain parts of that business where if they have a stronghold on a certain market, that should be looked at. And you know, regulation has never been great for anyone. So, but some degree of self-regulation, perhaps some degree of scrutiny to make sure that everybody's getting a fair playing field is called for. But I don't expect large-scale breakups or large-scale uh, regulation across big tech. So Nikesh Ed has been listening, and he calculated that Palo Alto Network shares are up almost 800%. Um, over the last decade. Um, I want to talk about the cyber landscape because we are unwinding the biggest hack in world history, the solar winds hack. And I'm curious, are, are we ready? Are we ready for the next big cyber threat? And where is that threat going to come from? 
Well, if you follow on from the notion that the next 10 years is going to be even more tech enabled than the last 10 years have been, we are creating more and more exposure across the entire infrastructure. Not everybody is ready to withstand the possibility of somebody hacking against it. We are as a country, or as perhaps as a world, going through one large hack. I think we're going to get bigger hacks in the future. This past, this 2020 had the most amount of cyber attacks than we had ever in the history of cybersecurity. So you are seeing with people working from home, with people you know, with distributed infrastructure, every company being accessible from every part of the world, you are increasing what we call the surface area of the enterprise. And that surface area needs to be effectively productive, pr protected. So I think you are going to see a surge in, or continued surge in cybersecurity spending or cybersecurity needs in the next 10 years, just that we're going to see a surge in uh, requirements for enterprise software. Now, the pandemic has tested all of us and certainly every CEO, and I'm curious how that's impacted your leadership uh, over the last 10 years and how you plan to create the workplace of the future now that you've learned what you've learned. Emily, when the pandemic hit, uh, I was advised by a great wise CEO that you should spend a lot more time with your teams. And that's what we did as a company. Uh, I spend 50% of my time now talking to employees, doing one-on-ones, doing larger group meetings, probably one a week uh, of more than 100 people. And part of that has been trying to make people feel secure, comfortable, because people are going through a lot in their lives right now, both personally and professionally. I think uh, that has borne fruit for us. It has proven to us that you know our, our employee scores are the highest, or people are relatively happier given what's going on. But I think we are going to have to come back to some sort of a normal, which is different from what we've been used to. Uh, we've been taught, we've been building a program called FlexWork with our friends at Zoom, Box, uh, uh, Splunk, as well as uh, many other players in the industry. And in that context, where we've come to is that we think people will come back to work, but perhaps not for five days. So we're going to end up with some sort of a hybrid right. outcome post the pandemic. Um well, it'll be fascinating to watch Nikesh Aurora. I hope we'll have you back many times over the next decade. Palo Alto Networks CEO. All right, coming up, more of this special edition of Bloomberg Technology. After this break, we're going to look at Amazon's empire and how much it's changed over the last 10 years, along with the biggest tech deals of the decade. This is Bloomberg. Magic. In 2011, Apple was on a roll. Products that caught fire included the MacBook Air, a thinner, faster iPad, and the iPhone 4S, which introduced us to Siri. Okay, here's a place matching on the day. It was also the last time visionary Steve Jobs took the stage. 2012 marked mobility as we saw Tesla unveil its Model S, the launch of ride-sharing company Lyft, and Google debut a driverless car. I even took it for a spin. This is incredible. 2013 saw virtual worlds dominate. Sony PlayStation 4 made a splash and Google debuted Glass. But with a price tag of $1,500, you can say the glass never went mass. In 2014, it seemed we all needed a little help in the form of an AI personal assistant, Amazon's Alexa. The time is 327. Inspired by the computer voice on board Star Trek Starship Enterprise, Alexa offered real-time information and followed commands. Alexa, add wrapping paper to the shopping list. I put wrapping paper on your shopping list. Speaking of space, 2015 was all about the heavens. Samsung's Galaxy 6 impressed critics and SpaceX's Falcon 9 successfully landed back on Earth, marking a major achievement in reusable engines. In 2016, more wearables gave us Apple's AirPods and the first commercial version of the Oculus Rift before Facebook bought it. In 2017, Tesla's Model 3 changed the conversation around electric cars, making them more accessible and design-wise more desirable. If it was a convertible you were after, 2018 had Microsoft flexing its 2-in-1 Surface Pro 6 PC. Ultra light and versatile were its selling points. Where you can use at your desk, where you can use on your lap. 2019 gave us the Magic Kingdom's foray into streaming. Disney Plus debuted, quickly becoming a rival to Netflix. In 2020, the year of the pandemic, Uber Eats generated $4.8 billion in revenue and Peloton sales exploded more than 170%, bolstering the home fitness industry. 
It all brings us to 2021, where we can expect more cloud, more AI, more quantum computing, 5G, and more. And oh, that $100 in Bitcoin you bought a decade ago, it's now worth around $5 million. Congratulations. In addition to Bitcoin, Amazon has also aged well. In the last 10 years, the company has exploded in size. In addition to growing its e-commerce business, they've built out logistics centers. And Amazon Web Services now powers a significant part of global business. This year will be another turning point for the company with the announcement that Jeff Bezos will be stepping down as CEO. Here to recap it all is our Bloomberg Tech Senior Executive Editor, Brad Stone, who is working on his second book, about Amazon. Brad, what will the next 10 years of Amazon look like? Right. Hi, Emily. Well, 10 years ago, when a little show called Bloomberg West got its start, Amazon had <laughs> 35,000 employees, an $80 billion market cap, and now it's 1.3 million employees and a 1.6 or $7 trillion market cap. So, you know, the lesson here is that, uh, uh, you know, we look the same as we have uh, over these last 10 years, but Amazon looks a lot different. Uh, in terms of the next 10 years, um, I think it's it's um, a more international company. Um, I think it it uh, it branches out in in areas like healthcare and satellite internet access and robotics. But look, the big question is really around Jeff Bezos, right? And we don't quite know how fully is he withdrawing, and if he does withdraw, you know how much of Amazon's innovativeness has come from him versus the culture of innovation that he started. You know, my sense is that a lot of it came from him. So the question will be for the next 10 years, how active an executive chairman will Jeff Bezos be? And that's something that probably only he knows. Uh, and, and we'll just have to see. Now, speaking of innovativeness, we've seen a lot of tech companies try to buy innovation over the last decade. Thinking about the biggest tech deals of the decade, whether it's Facebook buying Instagram or WhatsApp, what did the biggest tech deals of the last 10 years tell you? Yeah, I think they, they tell us a couple of things. One, these tech companies perhaps are not as innovative or nimble, as creative as, as they like us to think. I mean, the defining moves of the last, last 10 years, as you say, have been these deals. And, and you mentioned a couple from Facebook, Amazon buying Whole Foods, Microsoft buying LinkedIn. You know, these are all areas in which, you know, the, the companies tried themselves. Amazon tried to get into groceries. Microsoft tried to put a social graph uh, on side its productive, alongside its productivity software, um, but it's the deals that really got them there. And then I say, I think the second pattern has really been how these companies have set up their acquisitions independently, right? So when you look at LinkedIn, there were a lot of promises a couple of years ago that Microsoft was really going to integrate the product into Office uh, or Windows. It really hasn't, but the LinkedIn deal has been a big success. And I think we can look at last year's deal, uh, Salesforce to buying Slack, and you look at the the uh, you know the independence that that Stuart Butterfield has at Slack, and we don't quite know how that'll pan out. But over the last ten years, a playbook has really been derived for these deals, and it includes really these big tech companies when they make these purchases, not meddling and screwing up the magic of the startup uh, that it, that it achieved in the first place. Well, Brad, since you mentioned Slack, I just thought I'd take a look back at one of my favorite moments over the last 10 years, which is when I was with you on live television with Stuart Butterfield, and we got a visit from a very unexpected guest. Take a listen. It's going to take a long time to figure it out. Are you guys All right, Stuart Butterfield. Right yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, it's yeah, it's yeah, Jared yeah, Leto, yeah. everybody. Oh, right. This is the smartest Not guy quite a joke out there, but <laughs> thank you, Jared. San Francisco, good to see you. Why are my favorite all-time favorite moments, Brad, of the last 10 years, and I'm so glad you got to share that one with me. That was fun, and I, I've admitted, <laughs> I, I had no idea who he was until you blurted it out. <laughs> well, look, speaking of, of deals, do you think we're going to see more deals, like Slack getting bought, or more breakups, like big tech, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, all of these companies being examined by the government around the world. What's going to define the next decade? I think it's more the latter than, than the former. I think at least for the, the biggest consumer facing technology companies, there is so much scrutiny that I don't think we can really expect to see deals 
on the scale of Facebook, Facebook buying WhatsApp or Google buying YouTube or, or for that matter, Amazon, Amazon buying Whole Foods. There's too much scrutiny, and I think the Biden administration is is really taking up the mantle of this bipartisan consensus that the big tech companies have gotten too big. As for as for breakups, uh, you know Mer Merrick Garland, the new uh, Attorney General, is someone who has taught antitrust. He's written about antitrust. We of course don't yet know who who the the Deputy AG will be in charge of antitrust. But you know you can expect not right. full fledged breakups of like AT and T in the in the 70s, but but perhaps scrutiny around unwinding some of these big deals. All right. Well, so much for you and I to cover over the next decade. Bloomberg Tech's Brad Stone, thanks so much for joining us on the special show. Still ahead, what's next for tech in the next 10 years? We are going to speak to Greylock partner and LinkedIn co-founder Reid Hoffman to take a peek into his pretty successful crystal ball in this special edition of the show. This is Bloomberg. sure about the next decade, it's that innovation will continue to happen faster than we expect. For a look into the Silicon Valley crystal ball, we turn to Reid Hoffman, co-founder of LinkedIn and a partner at Greylock Partners, one of the earliest investors in companies like Facebook and Airbnb. I asked him what he thinks will surprise us most in the next 10 years. The most interesting thing to watch is the intersection of all of these different uh, technological trends, like AI with synthetic biology or even AI with nuclear fusion and fission. And that these intersections will cause accelerations and new developments that people won't necessarily think of. What do you think the next big social platform will be? Well, um, there's, there's, there's already a few in the sides. There's, 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 there's a gaming one with Roblox. There's a, there's a neighborhood one with, with Nextdoor. There's various of these that are, that are, that are in motion. Um, there's TikTok. But, there's Discord. There's yep. Snap just hit a hundred billion dollar valuation, which was surprising. Yes, exactly. And you know, one of the things, maybe the right way to, to think about the question, the great question you just asked me is to say, um, it used to be there was kind of like one at a time, right? And now there's so much going on in tech. The answer is, how many will there be? Mm. <laughs> right? Like, like what's the number of them versus the one? And what's the different vectors that they'll be operating on? Right, because like for example, will will we now have augmented reality through mobile phones? That's going to be the next social platform. Like you know, like those kinds of things. Actually, in fact, might be because there's so much happening in tech. That might actually be the actual shape of the answer. When you look a year out, as we come out of the pandemic and into hopefully a new normal, what changes about Silicon Valley, and what stays the same now that we've been through? This experience? Well, I think what changes is that we've gotten a lot more familiar with kind of distributed work bases um, and the fact that you can actually have distributed companies. Um, and so I think all the tools being accelerated there, and I think there's a lot of folks, but I think it won't be like I, I think that three years from now, uh, at Greylock, we'll still be hearing pitches from companies that are like, well, we got a we got a founder here, and we got a founder here, and we got a development office here, and we got a development office here, and like these three people are working from their houses. And, and I think that will still be the case for what's happening. And so that I think has broadened out more. We at Greylock have actually invested in more things outside of Silicon Valley than we have in the last few years, mm -hmm. uh, just because of the natural, natural way of doing it. The thing that I think will actually come back is that still there's an intense network effect in Silicon Valley. That people say, you know, I wanna go join, a, 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 like found a new software company. Um, I want to assemble a group of founders and early people to create a, a bold new product. Uh, well, Silicon Valley has its own network effect. It's a network effect of, 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 of technologists and companies and universities and capital and all the rest of that stuff. And so I think that will come back. Now, my hope is that it will also come back in multiple areas around the U.S. and around the world, and that this, 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 this kind of smash the world with a, the COVID mallet will then allow more areas to grow at the same time. What are the biggest challenges that the tech industry will face over the next decade? I think the, the biggest one, um, which is kind of obvious to everyone lo looking at the news today, is that now tech has become so important, it's part of social infrastructure. It's part of the way we, you know, we live and operate and so forth. And so how do you have society as a customer? How do you, uh, and how do you treat that? And what are your responsibilities as a 
as an entrepreneur, as a founder, as a CEO, as a tech company? Uh, how do you engage in dialogue? Who do you engage in dialogue with? Um, you know, what are the th places that when, you know, entity X tells you this, I stand for society and you should do X. And, you know, how do you do that? And how do you navigate that? And by the way, that'll be true within societies and that'll be true across society. <laughs> oh my goodness, you guys. <laughs> Sorry, my kids are here. Thank you, Cooper. Thank you guys. I'm so glad you're, wow, now I'm really on the spot. <laughs> oh. um, first of all, that was Reed Hoffman. Um, these are my four children. The show is my first baby and I'm just so, I feel so blessed today. Thank you to everyone, all the producers, the editors, the people you never see on camera. Thank you to my husband who's here um, and for all of you for supporting me every single day. I can't wait for the next decade. Love you all. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>